Hello everyone, welcome back to the Annals for 22nd January 2024, where we will be trying to understand the most important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. I hope you all are doing well. With that, let us look at the table of contents today. The very first article is regarding the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor and a very beautiful editorial article regarding the same. In the next one, we will be looking at the concept of alien invasive species and the recent incident related to the same. In the next one, we will be looking at the World Trade Organization dispute settlement body and why it is in news. In the next one, we will be looking at a very interesting scheme of the government India related to the drone Didi scheme. And finally, we will be wrapping up the discussion with the national monetization pipeline because as of now, the same is expected to increase in the next year's budget. Now, starting with the very first article, this is about the revival of the IMAC because a very beautiful article came in the Hindu related to the same. The context is that of late, there has been a revival of the IMAC idea amid the choppy geopolitics of the entire world. Now, the, to give you a very brief flavor of what IMEC is, it stands for India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. This is envisioning a system where the railways, the roadways, the various infrastructural arrangement of the member countries of this particular arrangement are linked properly, particularly to also combat Chinese ambitions in this particular region. Now we'll be looking about more aspects in detail in the coming slides. To give you an idea of the syllabus, this is represented in the GS2 mains where we need to look at the important international institutions, agencies and fora. Now to start with the very basics, we have to understand that this IMEC is consisted of various countries. Our own India is within the organization. And then we have the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, Greece, the European Union. Prominently, there are some countries in the European Union, such as France, Italy, Germany, and the United States too. So what are all these countries, you know, representing for? They are representing for an economic corridor. An economic corridor for what? for essential goods, services, exports, that is the trade between the countries. And also they are focusing mostly on energy security. By energy security, we mean not only the transit of fossil fuels, that is the crude oil, but also transportation, manufacturing, distribution of clean and green fuels such as hydrogen too. So this is the broad idea of this economic corridor that is present between these nations and as we can look at this map here, right? This particular corridor has been divided into the eastern corridor which is representing India and the connections that India will be having with the Gulf region. By the Gulf region we mean that this particular region consisting of countries such as Saudi Arabia, Israel and so on. For the north, we will be having the northern corridor, which will be connecting further the Gulf region to the European region and also beyond to the USA. So we have found that this is a very you know, seamless way of connectivity, ensuring connectivity between, between these particular nations. Now, how will they connect? They will be connecting via railways. They will be connecting via ship rail transit network, which is a very, very special network given a name also. The name is Partnership for Global Infrastructural Investment, which is a G7 initiative, but prominently under the Blue Dot Network. Now, this particular initiative of Partnership for Global Infrastructural Investment is actually to combat Chinese influence in this particular region. Particularly, this initiative is trying to mobilize and say, reduce the gap that the lower or say lower middle class income countries have with respect to their infrastructure such as sheepways, railways and the G7 countries will be investing in the same to bolster the infrastructure and logistic scenario in these particular nations. India is also participating in the same through this IMEC and here also we have road transportation routes. Now this is very very important for us to consider. See, look at this map. We have India on this side, we have the Eastern Corridor, we have the Northern Corridor here. And also we can find that we can link or say India has linked with IMEC through Saudi Arabia, right? To Saudi Arabia in this particular region. 
right further india is linked to europe via the mediterranean sea so this is a very intelligent way of connecting and say utilizing both waterways and roadways right and if this you know particular initiative or say particular organization consisting of these particular nations are successful or say their synergies are say cumulated right it will be resulting into the faster exports of goods and services from india itself right also apart from this there are also electricity cables hydrogen pipeline and also a high uh, you know high speed data cable and these are all aimed to boost the internet connectivity trying to boost the energy security imperative in this particular region so a very very important initiative particularly to this particular region now here we have to understand and look at the present status of iemec now why present status i mean that we have to look as to how the iemec is conceptualizing in real world because I, as of now also back in the g20 summit india also participated and say that the iemec is pivotal to india's interest in this particular region and also european region but how so far it has conceptualized see the progress so far is kind of limited because we have to understand that all of the countries are kind of involved in some conflict or some you know distance with some particular regions right and here we can find some you know green shoots some good news that that the rail projects such as the etihad rail and the gcc railway so you know it is present in the saudi arabia they are completing the completions right the project are kind of nearing completions next also we find if we look at the land route if you look at the land route here that is connecting the hatida and the haifa ports and the haifa region of the israel this particular region is will be connected by roadways right and also we can understand that this particular roadway here india will be the you know region you know to the right side of this particular roadway here through the mediterranean sea the european region will be in touch so we have to understand that utilizing this region and completing the projects completing the both pipelines and the railway and highway projects particularly for iems in this region is very very important because again we have to go to geography here that we have to understand that in this particular region here we have the suez canal where majority of the trade and say ship right pass through and we have to understand that through iemc we are subverting this suez canal and transporting the entire you know uh, you know particular shipments through the land route here so this particular land route is at the core of this particular iemc and their completion is very very uh, elemental and particularly both nations of saudi arabia and israel who are you know the stakeholders in this region are completing the same so it is a kind of a good idea next we have to understand as of september 2023 according to the memorandum of understanding which is released by the united states on iemc right according to the last september date the usa would have released the final draft agreement of say iemc after 90 days but here geopolitical crisis is taking place here what geopolitical crisis particularly the israel palestine war which is taking place at gaza right we know that this particular issue is rattling up countries particularly in the gulf region and also we have to understand this particular gaza war is also you know undoing the peace keeping efforts particularly under the abraham accords right this abraham accords particularly tried to reduce the tensions between israel and the rest of the islam nations but again this gaza war is striking or say flaring up those intentions and we have to understand that israel is again at war with not only say palestine or say gaza in this particular region but also indirectly with nations such as iran and other islam nations too because we have to understand this particular war is stoking tensions based on religious affairs and also based on long historical conflicts so there can be a instance where the nations of say israel 
Saudi Arabia, UAE, who are a part of this IMEC, can have a distrust on each other. So this is an impediment. Next, we also find that Turkey is not a part of this project or it was intentionally left out because we have to also understand that Turkey is also close to China and you know presence of Turkey in this particular corridor may also stoke some tensions between China and the US. So on this hand, Turkey is also angry with the project. It is angry that why you have included Saudi Arabia and Israel where you could have just routed the land route through Turkey itself because Turkey also connects Asia and Europe, right? So Turkey is also miffed over this particular affair. Next, we have to understand that recently in the USA, which is due for elections in 2024 itself, Donald Trump is also seeing a rise in their own popularity levels. So if there is a, you know, chance of, you know, Donald Trump becoming the president of the United States again, there can be a, you know, opportunity that, you know, this particular project may be, say, you know, given higher priority, but again, with opportunity turns, you know, there are always crises. It is also said that Donald Trump may not also focus on major global projects involving the USA because he wants to reduce the expenditure of the USA. And that is why we have to understand this is kind of a mix back too. Now for India also there are some issues. The very first issue is the issue of hydrogen energy. We know that we can generate hydrogen energy through various ways, through both using fossil fuels such as coal, gas and so on. Also, we can produce hydrogen via renewable energy such as solar energy, wind energy and so on. But here, we have to understand most of the hydrogen production in this particular region is dominated by fossil fuel producing countries such as Saudi Arabia. And if a clean fuel such as hydrogen is produced by a non-clean fuel such as, you know, crude oil, then the overall adjective or say objective of producing more and more hydrogen or clean and green hydrogen will not be fulfilled. So this is one sticking point. Second, there is this high amount of containerization. This means that if we are transporting, you know, goods and services over land route, particularly in this IMEC, we have to use more and more containers. And again, we have to understand India has its own policy of logistics, such as a national logistic policy of 2022, where it tends to reduce the cost of transportation. But using more and more containers will be adding to more and more costs, particularly over land routes, because this particular land route over Saudi Arabia and Israel will be using containers only over the highways in this particular region. But this is running against national logistics policy where India is trying to reduce the cost of logistics. So this is again going against, right? So these are two sticking points for India. Now for this, we have to understand again, according to the article here and also according to various experts, we see that IMEC, the idea of IMEC though, it is facing some geopolitical headlines or headwinds, we have to understand it is also seeing a revival. Why? Because there are some various issues. See, that the very first issue is with the Swiss Canal itself. And when we are looking at the Swiss Canal, we also, for prelims perspective, we need to look at the countries surrounding the same and also in the near vicinity. We have to see that there are countries such as Egypt, we have countries such as Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, you know, Syria, which are in the particular region. And you can understand this particular region is very, very volatile, particularly due to various conflicts arising out of the same. So many shipping industry experts, businesses, they're trying to diversify beyond the Swiss Canal. And what a better diversification than the IMAC. So there is this opportunity too. That is why this is one of the ideas which is reviving the IMEC dream again, which India also proposed in the G20, right? India also said that we must be trying to shift away our shipping routes or main shipping routes apart from the, or say other than the Swiss Canal. Next, we also we have seen recently the crisis in Gaza, crisis taking place in Yemen, also, we have found that there are various piracy concerns in the you know, Indian Ocean region. And this is also, you know, trying to put more and more pressure on the existing shipping businesses. And here we have to understand that this particular IMEC also is also solving this particular issue because we are utilizing the land route 
in this particular region instead of Suez Canal and also instead of traversing beyond East uh, Africa. So we can also reduce these kind of issues too. And finally, we have to understand that China is also actively trying to promote its own project such as Bed and Road Initiative. It is trying to create a strategy of involving nations such as Sri Lanka in debt diplomacy of China. So this particular issue, this particular you know, uh, issue of Chinese, you know, developmental agenda and their dominance over this particular logistic shipping industry is also one of the issues why IMEC was proposed by the US in the very first place. So these are all the reasons why this revival of the IMEC is taking place and this is a very, very important article for your mains. In the next one, we will be looking at a very, very interesting concept known as the invasive alien species because recently a new study has revealed that two species of mosquito fish, which looks like these, has invaded the various ecosystems across India, cutting across the regions of North India, you know, and South India. We have to understand this is very, very important for GS3 mains where we have conservation, environmental pollution and degradation and EIA. For this, we have to look at this particular aspect of IAS, that is this alien invasive species. And also, prelims is very, very near. These topics are being asked in prelims almost every year. What UPSC does is that UPSC will be giving you some names, right? Names of species such as this particular species or this one. And they will be say, telling you to identify the nature of the same, right? So please, you know, brush up your concepts and this particular topic is that's why very, very important. See, what do you mean by anything that is invasive? Invasive, the very word invasive means that it is coming from outside, right? And it is also not only coming from outside, it is creating a disbalance in the natural process. For example, say in history, we have learned about many invasions, right? And what invaders did, it is they came in and plundered and maybe they stayed uh, and maybe some even went back to their particular regions, right? And we know that the effect or the impact of this inv invasion was very, very severe. And this is particularly what also what happens in the environmental and ecological studies too. There are some species, there are some plants, there are some animals who do not belong usually to a particular region. But when they are introduced, both naturally or unnaturally, right, they create some impacts over ecology, which is generally very, very harmful. Now, given here are some lists of some species, right? Also given here, we also see that we have the sustainable developmental goals, which are represented in this tiny green and red and yellow boxes. We find that there are some species and we also we will be looking at the names briefly that which is also disturbing the sustainable developmental goals such as fall army worm right is causing severe yield losses of maize across africa that means this particular worm that you can look here is crawling up the leaves of maize crops and destroying the same potentially also destroying the entire maize crops then we have the tiger mosquito who is spreading diseases such as dengue, chikungunya and various other because this is a very very dangerous vector for diseases. We also find that this particular alien invasive species can also invade the clean water such as the freshwater crayfish which is doing what? It is deteriorating the water quality because we have to understand say imagine this is a river and generally there are species A, B, C of, uh, of fish which are found in this river, which have been present in the river for thousands and millions of years. Now suddenly if you introduce a new species of fish in this particular river, this will be creating what? These species will be having their own demand of food, own demand of water, you know, own demand of nutrition, right? And they will be disturbing the entire ecological balance of the river. So this is why we have to understand these species are very, very dangerous in particular scenarios, right? Now we can look at other examples also, such as water hyacinth, right? We understand we have various experiments of our own lives, right? When we looked at water hyacinths, right? These are very, very common. And this is 
also causing various issues in the agricultural area of or say scenario of India. And this water hyacinth, we have to understand, is also not say endemic to India. It was bought by Europeans, right? It was bought by Europeans during the colonial times. And this is also creating mishaps and issues in the particular scenario. Then we have various other examples which you can look at briefly by pausing the video or also looking at your handouts too which are you, these particular things are also given in handouts so look at the bivalves mescues copu lionfish you know brown tree snakes these are some examples which are you know invasives and we have to understand these particular species are totally disrupting the local environment there now looking at how they actually proliferate right first they are introduced they can be introduced in two ways. First, in an unintentional way or in intentional ways. What is the unintentional way? Such as say releasing blast water from ships into oceans. Right, when you store ballast water in ships, right, it contains various microorganisms which when released into ocean, they are foreigners, they are alien, right, and they can degrade the water quality and also the quality of life in the oceans too. Or say organisms in timber wood products which are packed and say exported internationally such as furnitures and when say some furnitures which can again contain some say foreign elements when they are exported to another nation they will be causing or wrecking havoc. Then we also have tourists we also have various you know cars, boats, railway ships which also travel from one place to another hence also transporting some invasive species from one place to another. Now these are unintentional ways. Human beings typically do not you know, intend to spread this, but there are some intentional causes too, such as when you, you know, release your say aquarium turtle or fish into a nearby pond, when you release your say aquarium fish into the pond, they will be say totally disrupting the pond ecosystem again by say exerting more demand on resources such as food and water and so on. Next, also plants are introduced for gardening and landscaping. Some of you may be having some hobbies of gardening and so on. Remember, when you are doing gardening in some say particular area and when you are using plants from another areas, remember that particular plant is alien to that particular region. And if by your mistake, right, if you kind of say release the seeds into the local soil and local environment that invasive species can you know spread across the region disturbing the local plants in the region. Next we also find that you know uh, various biological control ways such as you know controlling house grows and so on this is also kind of introducing the species. So when they're introduced they first establish and they try to invade by invading that means they take up the spaces for other plants and species and then they spread. And this is very, very dangerous. It threatens the survival of native plants and species. They also alter the vegetation structure and come on, you know, community you know, composition in this particular region. They also human, uh, you know, danger human health as we have also seen in this particular examples. So they are very, very dangerous if they are, you know, not controlled in a particular way. Now, after understanding the very basics, let us now look at, you know, a very, you know, important case study, which is also the context of your current affairs. See, in this particular article, there are two, you know, species names given, you know, Gambusia affinis and Gambusia holbrooki. Now, don't worry, you don't have to remember these names, scientific names, you just have to, you know, understand that this Gambusia, you know, fish or popularly it is also known as mosquito fish. Right? This was introduced into a, you know, in, in India for you know, many years right now. You know, even states such as Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, Punjab, they also have introduced uh, you know, these species, particularly in rivers and ponds, to do one thing. What is that thing? That is to combat mosquitoes. Given by its name only, we can understand this, the name is mosquito fish. This is particularly introduced to combat mosquitoes. And we have to understand over the entire world, right, in this particular world, more than 500 million people are affected by mosquito bone diseases in a year. In India, the number is around 40 million in a particular year. So, the government thought of doing something good. Now, uh, we have to understand that 
we can use pesticides chemicals to spray on still water to destroy the you know larva of the you know mosquitoes on the still water bodies now that is one thing but again yes chemic use of chemicals are harmful for the environment right so the scientists thought that okay let us do one thing let us introduce a new fish which particularly feeds on the larva of the mosquito so if there are no larva no mosquito so all good news right so this should be the thing but there are some issues when this particular mosquito fish is being introduced into the local pond or say water bodies or anywhere we have to understand they are doing what they are displacing and preying on the native fauna and in australia they did what they entirely killed off the native fish species right there is a particular place in australia where in that particular region the entire species of particular one fish has been eliminated because they feed on those fish they also destroy the larva of not only mosquitoes but also amphibians too so the, all the tadpoles and say the frog eggs and everything they are being consumed by this fish so that also leads to the extinction of some other species too so this is not a very very good way of dealing with the environment and that is why according to the world health organization this particular you know fish has been banned from being used against the mosquitoes because this is having for the larger environmental ramifications now here we have to control the aias or say ias whatever you say that is the alien invasive species not the ias exam that you are aspiring for right so please do remember that it is the alien invasive species that we have to control and for that we have various international collaboration and various international agreements and frameworks the very first is you know that is very very important for us to understand is the coming montreal global biodiversity framework which is trying to promote greater amount of biodiversity in the entire you know world and by doing so it is also trying to limit the spread of aias uh, uh, you know across the world by also formulating some codes by formulating some say rules and regulations of the export of some live animals and live plant species too next we have the conventional biological diversity which was implemented in 1992 and here is also trying to promote and say govern the rules of games right of export of live animals right and also plants then we also have the convention on conservation of migratory species we know that there are many migratory birds animals which migrate among you know say across national borders and so on and this is very very natural but we have to understand we have to identify those animals who naturally migrate versus those animals and plants who do not naturally migrate and this particular convention is looking at the same next we also have the sites which is a convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora now this is very very important why because it denotes that some species of plants and animals they can be traded they their trade may be regulated or some species whose trade is totally prohibited right so the these are particular initiatives which are present internationally apart from that we also need to educate the local people educate the local women farmers small and marginal you know workers and so on about the you know impacts of this ais and further our own national institutions universities and research organizations they must be investing more on the short term impacts medium term impacts and long term impacts of you know ais and that is why india must spend more on funding the r and d or research and development so that we can have proper implication of which ais is good and which is bad as we have seen in this case study that this particular fish species is not good and that is why this particular study also said that the ministry of health right and family welfare they must be particularly highlighting that this species is dangerous and they cannot be used by governments we have seen the states like andhra pradesh is still trying to envisage the introduction of you know mosquito fish to combat you know dengue malaria and such diseases but that particular practice has to be totally prohibited as of now in the next one we'll be looking at the wto dispute body particularly this is in news why because according to the gtri 
The WTO dispute settlement body revival is facing issues over country differences. This is very very important for our UPSC GS3 means where we have to look at the various aspects of Indian economy. And by looking at the various aspects of Indian economy, we are looking at the external sector where we need to look at the various concepts of trade and one of the subtopics of this trade is the WTO and its functioning. Now we know that the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is the overarching body that is looking after the entire trade in goods and services across the world. Now its members run into more than 160 plus countries and these countries represent more than 90% of the entire world trade. So we can understand that the WTO is a very very you know important body for international trade. And here the headquarter is at Geneva and it was set up in 19. 95 when the general agreement of tariff you know was actually you know subsumed into the WTO because this particular GATT was not sufficient for the entire economic or say world trade and that is why the WTO was conceptualized but here we will not be looking too much into WTO we'll be looking particularly first into the organization structure of the WTO because it is very very important for prelims and also we'll be looking more into the WTO dispute body and the various issues out of the same. Now see, looking at the organizational structure, we can find that at the very top is the ministerial conference. This is the apex, you know, body of the WTO. After that, we have the general council. General council is particularly very, very important because it is having the general council meeting as trade policy review body, which looks at the various trade policies of entire, you know, members, right? Such as trade policies of US, India and so on. It will be, say, filing reports, making recommendations and proposing same to the General Council. Then we also have a very, very important body here, which is the General Council meeting as dispute settlement body. This dispute settlement body will be looking into the disputes of say one member against another or one member against two, three, four or any other members. So we have to understand that trade is an economic activity and any economic activity can have some issues. This dispute resolution body is actually also known as the crown jewel because we have to understand that if there are any disputes between any parties, there must be some dispute resolution and those countries, those parties must be abiding the same and that is what it particularly does, right? This dispute settlement body such as the dispute looks into the various disputes and so on. Now here we have to understand that apart from this particular organized structure, there are also various other trade negotiations, committees, right? Council on Trade, Goods and Services, right, which are given in this particular figure. So please do pause the video and please do look at all these particular components and subcomponents because this is very, very important. And also at one particular image, in particular image, you are looking at all of the particular important bodies and councils and agreements of the WTO. So please do note this particular thing. Now, looking at the WTO dispute body, this I told it is known as a crown jewel because it settles the disputes and we have to understand that trade is a very very important activity and if there are impediments or say barriers to trade the entire economic order will be collapsing that is why that is why this particular settlement system is required and here we this particular uh, body is too tired that it is having the dispute settlement system at the top and next we have the appellate system. Now if a country is filing say disputes against another country, it will be say decided by the dispute settlement body. After that, if that particular country has any issues with the judgment or the order of the dispute settlement body, then it can go to the appellate body. Now appellate body apart from this functioning as appellate functions, it also hears appeals from the WTO panels. Right? There are various WTO panels. We will be studying that this dispute settlement body has various, you know, uh, powers and functions to set up panels. So it is also hearing appeals from those panels. And also the appellate body we have to understand is a very, very crucial thing. It is consisting of seven members, seven members with four year terms. And if there are say not enough members who will be functioning as judges, this particular body will not perform at all. 
there won't be any dispute settlement body. Now, this is what exactly the case is as we will be looking very soon. See, again, uh, the DSP has authority to do various functions. First, to establish dispute settlement panels, to also, uh, you know, relate matters to arbitration, adopt panel appellate body and arbitration reports and study the same. So it is having a very, very important, uh, you know, function. Then it will be also maintaining surveillance over the implementation of the recommendations which has been given in these stages. It will be also authorizing the suspension of conscientious in events of non-compliance between various countries. For example, say, if India is being given some benefit of trade, for example, say, India is on the virtue of, say, being a developing nation, it is given some advantages, right? Now, if, say, India is involved in some non, say, or say, illegal activities or, say, activities which do not promote free trade, do not promote the most favored nation statuses and so on, they will be, say, penalized and also they can also suspend those benefits or concessions that India is enjoying, for example. So this body has this kind of powers too. Also, now we have to look at that there are some issues with this body. Now, the very first issue is the rise of protectionism, particularly the rise of China and the clash that USA is having with China. Because we have to understand that since 2016-17, USA under Donald Trump became very, very protective. It tried to promote its own goods and services and say it became very, very, you know, rest, you know uh, import uh, restricted nation. And that is why we have to understand the trade wars also took place in the, you know, 2018-19 years. And that led to a significant crisis in the entire economic, you know, or say ex external economy of the entire world. Next, we have to understand that one fourth of all disputes related to US laws or other measures are having issues by some other nations because we have to understand that due to this particular protectionism by say US, USA has modified many of its laws, particularly with try to reduce the imports from other nations. And one fourth of all the disputes with US, right, by countries such as India, Venezuela, and various countries such as China, even, right, they say that US's laws are so, right, that we have to go for dispute resolution, that US's economy is not open as it was around, say, five to 10 years ago. And that is causing some issues. Next, the WTO itself said that the USA laws and measures are WTO inconsistent between five to six times in one particular year. That means that the WTO itself says that USA, your trade policies are not good for world trade. Please do modify the same. And also we have to understand since USA is a very, very influential member of the WTO, right? It is blocking the appointment of new judges, right? It is blocking the appointment of new judges. Why? Because if you appoint the judges to the appellate body, that, that is a dispute settlement body, that can, you know, rule some verdicts on these issues, which are primarily created by the USA because it is trying to becoming more and more protective and also combating China. And that is why it is also preventing the appointment of any new judges since 2019. And this is totally, you know, uh, you know, limiting the functionality of this particular body. Next, we have to also understand that there are many special and differential treatment provisions which are given to India, which are given to China, which are given to many developing nations. And this particular initiative such as uh, letting India to promote MSPs, give incentives to sugarcane farmers and so on. These are the uh, economic packages that the Indian government must be giving their farmers and India being a developing country, it is particularly fine to do so. But there are some developed nations which have problems with this. And they also say that these provisions must not be given to the developing nations. Why? Because, you know, these particular provisions are reducing the prices of exports from, say, these developing nations. And when these exports are going to developed world, they are facing competition from countries such as India and the other developing nations. So there are some issues related to this. And finally, there are also issues related to transparency and legal certainty with respect to the functioning of the WTO's body. And according to the USA and also the various experts in USA, they allege that if the 
a particular dispute settlement body is you know functioning properly or say they are given more and more powers that will be attributing to judicial overreach that will be you know pertaining to judicial overreach that means that this particular particular organization of wt is to promote world trade but this judi you know dispute body is a judicial body now world trade and judicial body one way we have the market one way we have the law so these two will be clashing and we can sometimes maybe understanding or seeing more law than economics so usa is you know alleging that the lack of transparency in the wto rules the wto settlement body and also the lack of legal certainty in the wto provisions itself on the you know dispute resolution body is creating this you know particular issue and that is why we have to understand that as we can understand so far that usa is having a bigger role to play in the wto because also we have to understand that usa is biggest economy in the entire world right and that is why their markets their sanctions their import quotas their import rules exports and exp exports of you know uh, uh, usa is very very pivotal to proper functioning of the world trade and that is why usa must be playing better role to reduce this kind of uh, you know laws or measures that reduce uh, you know imports into the us they must be looking into promoting more and more free trade appointing judges to the wto also usa has issues with india and vice versa india has issues with the us particularly in 2017 18 these issues surfaced when usa imposed some restrictions on indian exports and also us imports of say aluminium and so on particularly after usa imposed some restrictions india also counted with retaliatory tariff retaliatory tariff means if a particular nation is imposing restrictions against your exports you will be also doing the same that is in retaliation so india also imposed retaliation retaliation tariffs on say harley davidson bikes and so on it was back in 2019 20 and right now this particular country is also coming to the table to iron out the differences this is appreciated and usa must be playing more and more role to the same and also we can find that 2022 geneva deal which was also brokered by india because india is a big champion of the developing countries at the wto india tries to promote more and more negotiation and also let me tell you the wto is that particular place where india and china is also partnering together to combat with the developed nations so this 2022 geneva deal is also you know signing some positive deals because the next 13 ministerial conference will be taking place at abu dhabi and maybe the 2022 deal which allowed some concessions of say special and differentiated treatment and also particularly provided relief to the indian sugarcane farmers maybe in the 13 ministerial conference we can see the same so this is all related to this particular article in the next one we will be looking at a very very important and interesting scheme no name as the you know drone didi scheme here the context is that women from various backgrounds and education qualifications right they are trying out a new employment opportunity that is to be trained as drone pilots we have heard about pilots who fly aircrafts right but right now we also need pilots who can fly drones right and also we have to understand drones have many uses across defense space also drones are very very important for agriculture and this is let this be one of your case studies also as how you can write good answers and supplement good points in your mains answers in agriculture say in gs3 by citing some examples like this and this is very important for upsc prelims economics and also upsc mains gs3 where you need to quote various agricultural schemes and also there is this particular keyword in syllabus such as using technology in farming so please do uh, you know write this down in your class notes in your notes where you can give this case studies of how women are being trained as pilots or drone pilots and this particular thing is also promoting you know agriculture now as we can see in this picture here a particular respected woman is trying to you know fly this particular drone this is aimed at increasing women empowerment and also harnessing technological innovation how 
because this particular scheme which is known as the namo drone this initiative is trying to envisage a particular scenario when the government will be supplying some drones to some women self help groups these women less self help groups will be given these drones and what they will be doing with those drones they will be renting out these particular drones to some farmers how see these self help groups while they are given the drones they will also be trained how to fly those drones and we know that drones have various uses in you know indian agriculture such as spraying fertilizers such as planting even seeds such as you know uh, going for the aerial mapping of the field so drones have multi purpose uses particularly this particular initiative is training women how to spray fertilizers properly and you may ask me that uh, you know uh, the spraying of fertilizers can also be done properly by uh, you know manually or say by tractors or say by using complicated farming machineries but yes here the government is also not only trying to promote drones and women empowerment and technology but also trying to promote something known as fertigation what is fertigation this actually came in upsc 2000 20 prelims what is fertigation it is consisting of usually two words fertilization and irrigation fertilization means that you are trying to promote more or say promote more and more pesticides right or uh, say uh, you know uh, fertilizers on your farm what you are doing you are mixing the fertilizers with the water that will be needed for irrigation and that water you will be spraying entire the field with drones this is exactly what the government is also trying to promote that is a fertigation system by using say nano urea nano dap right and so on so this is this particular initiative also there are many startups who are involved in drone manufacturing they will be also say encouraged by this particular scheme so we can understand and also let us think for one minute that one scheme and having so many benefits so one of you do one thing in the comment let me know how many very you know variety of stakeholders are benefited in this particular scheme and also do quote the same things in your main answers too in the final article we'll be looking at national monetization pipeline because as of now according to reports there will be a record mop up of around 1.5 trillion indian rupees in you know financial 2024 and mining and highways to contribute to around 1 trillion dollars because it is expected that in the recent you know in the budget you know that will be you know the, you know uh, released in the next month so this particular initiative will be given a big philip and that is why we need to discuss why because economy is one of the subjects under upsc prelims and here let us understand the very basics first imagine that you have a land right and on that land you have a uh, say house and a garage too suppose that you do not have any car now what will you do with the garage say you can rent it out right you can rent it out and maybe uh, i or say anyone else who may be having a car will be parking the same in your garage and paying you some rent this is exactly the same thing imagine the government having many garages or many land which is lying vacant and what the government can do the government generally has many assets such as as a land i told you right it has land it has railways it has roads power transmission national gas pipelines then we have power generation oil pipelines telecom connections mining airports stadiums and so on right now what the government will be doing the government will be envisaging that these particular assets can be utilized by the private sector particularly when the governments and the private sector comes together we know at the know it as the public private partnership right so when the private sector will be say leasing out say the renting out this particular assets they will be giving some rent to the government but we have to understand here the government is not giving out away the ownerships because here the government will be giving lease kind of a rent to the private parties now there will be various contracts signed various agreements signed between the government and the private sector but here leasing will be taking place of these amount of assets right so both the government can be benefiting why because the government will be getting lease 
more money for more government schemes and so on. The private sector, they do not have to purchase anything new. They just have to pay rent and operate their businesses of say running stadiums, airports, mining and so on. So this is a very, very good amount, you know, model of public-private partnership. And here, only the revenue rights are given. Here, rail, roads, power projects are contributing to around 66% of the entire value. So you have to understand, the most of the focus is given on railways, roadways and power sector. So please do revise it in your payments preparation. We also, also understand that the revenue will, which will be generated will be going into greenfield projects or the revenue that the government will be getting here, the government will be constructing new projects from, you know, scratch. Greenfield projects, that means, you know, the government have to build everything from the very scratch. And who will be implementing? It will be implemented by an empowered committee headed by a cabinet secretary. So this is a very, very important scheme. And that is why you need to look at this particular thing from a prelims perspective. Now, this was all for today. I thank you all for being a very, very patient audience. I hope you will learn a lot. And after this particular discussion, do attempt the quiz, which is following the same. Thank you. Till we meet again soon.